Hello, my name's Bill Watts and I'm a researcher at Harper Adams University studying for my PhD. Uh, the topic that I'm investigating is biofumigation of potato cyst nematodes. Now, biofumigation is a term which we use for um, fumigating soils uh, with gases released from a biological source, in the instance that I'm looking at, from plant material. So here we have an Indian mustard plant um, which has been bred specifically for biofumigation. The fumigation uh, arises from disruption of the tissues. So when we break the tissues like this, what happens is, is that glucosinolate molecules, which are sugar-rich molecules, are cleaved by an enzyme known as myrosinase. Previously, these two are compartmentalized within the tissues. The myrosinase splits the sugar from the glucosinolate and the remaining glucosinolate structure, which is composed of nitrogen and sulfur, um, rearranges to something slightly more stable, however very volatile, um, known as isothiocyanate, and this is what reduces our pest. So it's now mid-October, um, which is about the right sort of time to be incorporating biofumigant crops, certainly for PCN suppression, which is what I look at. The soil temperatures are typically around about 12, 13 degrees, um, and that's good for our biofumigation. If we leave it any longer, it may reduce, and then we might not get as good um, a, a hydrolysis reaction and release of gases. The crop here was drilled um, at the end of August going into September, and so whilst it's good foliage, it's going to break down well, you can see the stems here are quite, quite bendy, um, and that will release a lot of gases. It hasn't put on as much biomass as it could have done if it was drilled in early August. That having been said, this is about the right sort of growth stage, um, budding to early flowering when we'll get the best residue and the best gas release. So the reason that this sort of growth stage, um, budding going into early flowering is preferable, is because our machinery implements that we can use, we're currently limited by what is out there. So I would use a horn topper and I'd play about with uh, shear plate settings and the type of tine, but ultimately the machine can only do what it can do. And the more lignified the crop is, the harder it's going to be to get a good residue which is going to release that, that gas. So if we look at this, crop here, this plant rather, we can see that it's already broken, um, breaks apart very very easily, that's going to help our machinery. Whereas if we had a plant that was near a mid flowering, which is typically where uh, the growth stage that people would be advising, the plant would be far more lignified and it might have a higher biomass and a higher glucosinolate uh, concentration at that time, but it's not going to be as easy to break apart. So we've talked a little bit about an appropriate crop physiology to uh, do biofumigation. Now we're going to go and talk about the maceration and incorporation implements which we can use to generate a biofumigant residue. Over the last uh, few years, uh, the research group that I work in at Harper Adams and through my PhD research more recently has done a lot of work on biofumigation of potato cyst nematodes and one of the areas that we've been um, looking in most recently is appropriate maceration and incorporation of biofumigants into soil and most specifically the appropriate generation of a biofumigant residue. One of the implement setups that we've been using is, is behind us over here where we have a horn topper and rotator combination. Right, so this is the horn topper that we're going to be um, looking at for our, our maceration and we've got a couple of uh, things under here which we're going to be talking about. One's going to be the type of tines that we can, uh, we can put onto this implement and also uh, our shear plate setting and how that can affect the residue quality that we get when we're doing biofumigation. The tines currently on this implement are knife tines uh, which have quite a narrow face which is going to hit the crop and they're quite good at chopping. Um, another type of tine that we could use would be one like this which is a uh, pigtail tine which has a much wider face or we could use typical hammer uh, type tines. Um, v tines again would be more of a cutting implement rather than the hammer which would be more bruising and we can use these tines or use combinations of them to try and generate the best residue that we can. 
So our incorporation implement that we're using here is a rotavator. Um, it's got some bed loosening tines at the front, um, typical S-blade arrangement, and then a cage roll at the back used to seal the surface. We could exchange this for a powered smear roller, um, which would do uh, a better job. Um, the implement here uh, is working at about 300 mil depth. Other implements that we could use, we could use um, a spader, which would work slightly deeper at about 400 mil, and again, we could use a powered smear roller on that. The benefit of these implements um, are that we can bolt them to the same machine as we've got our maceration implement, and that means that um, we have a constant working speed, about three kilometers per hour, um, and but crucially, the interval between chopping the residue and incorporating it is very, very short. About 10 seconds and that's crucial when you consider our gases aren't uh, around for very long.